thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, what I was saying was that we're going to be at EJF, we're going to be rolling out these kind of webinar formats, which are anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. We will also soon be rolling out another format, which would be kind of a lunch and learn. They'll be almost weekly and very narrowly focused on specific subject matters that we think people have either asked a lot of questions about or would be beneficial to understand. So they could be looking for that schedule as well for the lunch and learn, be uh, almost once a week on the same day at lunchtime for 10 to 15 minute discussion. And then it could go longer if people want to have, if have questions to ask. But today is a, a webinar on successful budgeting. Thanks again for coming today. And um, I'm going to go to the waiting room quickly here. Uh, let's see, how do I do that here? Um, she get up on right there. Waiting room view. That's what I want from it all. Okay. So I'll put this over here. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. I have made it fairly large. Hopefully, that's large enough for people to see and follow. This yes. Will the, this will be the script that I will follow today. My talking points. I will make these available once the um, session is completed. I will also, we are recording this and I will make the recording available on our website as well. So if you miss something, you can always watch the recording. Just follow some simple rules today. This is a regular Zoom call. It's not the kind of Zoom call that you do for, uh, sometimes for webinars where nobody can even talk on those things. So you can actually communicate with me today if you want to. Obviously, hopefully not everybody comes in at the same time. But uh, while you're not talking, please do remain on mute so you're not bothering other people. Um, do feel free to ask questions. If you have questions, I'm happy to hear from people. Um, you, can, you can do it in the chat, although I won't have much chance to look at the chat um, th while I'm talking, obviously, but I will stop at the end of each section. There's three sections and ask for specific questions. And don't be afraid to ask questions. No such thing as a stupid question. If you're thinking it, I promise you somebody else is thinking it as well. <clears throat> okay, so let's just dive right in. Um, this seminar today is about budgets. I know to some people, budget seems like kind of a necessary evil. It's kind of painful. It's a lot of numbers. It seems to take up time. And it is true, but the truth is, is that budgeting is a really an integral part of the successful financial management for any association. A budget is like a roadmap. It really helps you um, create success for your community. It also is a communication tool and an education tool for your community as well. So let's talk about Item number one, which is why do I have to have a budget? And the truth is, is that most bylaws require a board as part of their fiduciary responsibility to have a budget. So yes, basically you are required to have a budget. You have to have a budget. So uh, I gave you an example here of what in the bylaws it might say about your budget. This says on or before a date, which is not less than 45 days prior to the end of the fiscal year, the board of directors shall adopt an annual budget. So there it's laid out. You have to do a budget and you have to have it done 45 days before the end of the year. If you're not familiar with your bylaws, you might wanna look it up and see whether it's a 45 day window or a 60 day window or a 30 day window. It does go on to say that the annual budget shall contain an estimate of the amount necessary to pay for the common expenses. Um, it also says common expenses shall include the amounts necessary to create and maintain reasonable reserves. So essentially your budget really has to focus on what are the common expenses and you should include some element in there for reserves. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this is why you need to have a budget. In addition to the kind of common sense reason, your bylaws often require you to have a budget. I tend to think of a budget as like a roadmap. It helps you know where you're going. Most of us wouldn't leave to an unknown place without having some kind of map or pull up our phone and get out Google Maps or whatever it is to help us get somewhere. A budget is the same thing. It helps you set some goals for the year. It helps you know where you are compared to what your budget is. So, you know, at every point during the year or 12 points during the year, you get a financial report to help you see whether or not you are in good shape or bad shape compared to your budget. So the budget is a planning tool and then you can compare yourself all during the year and see how you're doing compared to budget. Um, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but it is really important to be realistic and attempt to use real numbers based on empirical data. Try not to do too much just from the gut. Try and look at the data in front of you and make some 
sound decisions about what your budget amounts should be. Setting expectations and decision-making framework. So again, a budget is also a communication tool. It tells your community where you are now, where you plan to be next year. And it sets some kind of real framework for you to make decisions. Sometimes this can be really handy. You know, if you have somebody that comes into a board meeting and they're pounding their fists and they want this and that done, frankly, if it's not in the budget, then we probably can't afford to do it. So it could be a useful tool if somebody's kind of being adamant about something. You can say, I'm sorry, it's not in the budget this year, but we'll consider it next year. But obviously, other kind of decisions have to be made about contracts and whether we can afford to do this repair or not this year. But a budget can provide a nice framework to make those decisions, a reasonable, empirically-based decision-making framework so that when you're looking at things and making decisions, you can point to something and say, this is why we decided this. And finally, and maybe most importantly, a budget will determine the fees for the next year. I know that seems obvious, but it, it does. You know, the budget is where you set those fees. It also determines the reserve amount. And I'm not going to delve too deep into this, but essentially, especially if you're an audited association, the amount that you set in your budget as your reserve is what is going to be tracked by your auditor as what you should have contributed. So whether or not you contributed or not, that's what's going to show up. So that's one thing to think about is that, you know, when you're setting that reserve amount, that number starts to be important because that really is tracking what you should be setting aside for reserves. Of course, if you're not, then you're underfunding reserves. All right, so that's into section one about why budgets are important and why you should be doing a budget. I'll stop here and just see if anybody has any questions about these things that I've discussed so far. You can unmute yourself and speak, obviously. Uh, will you be able to make this outline available? Yes, the outline will be available. I will send it out to everyone after the meeting. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, sorry for coming in late. No problem. Yeah, Damn so if you came in late, let me just say, this is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website. Um, as I did last time, I will make this into a PDF and I will send it out to everybody after the meeting so you have the talking points. Sam, I have a real quick question about reserves, and I know you said you weren't going to get into it real deep right here, but I don't know if you're going to talk about this a bit in later in your presentation, but um, is there uh, like a best practice or a typical amount or percentage even um, that is recommended for reserves um, and um, if if it's if it changes uh, based on your organization or whatever, is there a helpful guidelines or tools to determine uh, what's the best percentage for your your uh, group to put aside for growth? I'm going to answer the question in two different ways. It's a great question, and I I often get asked this question. So just from a financial standpoint, if you go to refinance your loan or somebody is buying new into your building. When a bank sends over a questionnaire about the financial soundness of a building, one of the questions they often ask is, is the association set aside at least 10% of their annual budget for reserves? So at a minimum, just in order to kind of qualify for what's generally accepted by banks as a financial imperative, you should be budgeting at least 10% of annual assessments going to reserves. Now, you asked that question, you know, is there kind of a benchmark? That's one way to benchmark. The way that I would benchmark would be if you have a reserve study, hopefully you've vetted the reserve study and you believe in the reserve study. And if you have, then you should be following what your reserve study says or trying to be at a pretty high percentage of that number. You know, it might be only 90%, but you want to be really working towards setting aside the money that what your reserve study says. That's the other benchmark that I would use. A lot of people want to focus on, well, we already have a million dollars in the bank. We don't need any more. And, you know, what I would say to that is I'd say, let's look at your reserve study. And if we believe in what it says, and the reserve study says that you should have $2 million in the bank right now because of X or Y or Z that's coming up in the next one to five years, then the truth is a million dollars is a lot of money, but you're probably still underfunded because in order to address the upcoming reserve items that you have, the capital expenditures that you will need to make, don't have enough money. You're going to either have to special assess 
uh, and or borrow money, which raises, of course, the, the cost of the money because you have to pay interest. So again, I try not to focus on how much money is in the bank. I try and focus on at least 10% as a benchmark for financing purposes. And I tend to look at the reserve study and say, what does a reserve study say? And try and get really close to that reserve study number. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any more questions on this first section? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna move on to the second section. So this section is about the process and how we look at budgets and how we create budgets. And we always start with the expenses. Frankly, I ignore income altogether. Income is irrelevant to me. I have to look at the expenses of what I think are the realistic numbers to operate and run our building. And once I've gotten those numbers, then whatever the income needs to be to cover that, I should believe in that. If it's a 1% increase or a 10% increase, whatever it is, I really want to vet these expense numbers because that's where I'm starting. So we, uh, your numbers on your monthly financials are broken down into about five or six sections. So I've just taken the sections and marched through here and we'll talk a little bit about each section. The first section are your administrative costs. And these are things, and I do have a sample here. Um, if, 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 if it's helpful for people to look at a sample, but these are things such as copying, printing, management fees, I don't know, NSF fees, I consider telephone part of administrative, but these kind of things that are mostly predictable, not necessarily under any type of contract, but administrative fees. These numbers really shouldn't, oh, I usually include audit and accounting here also. And usually those are the two biggies, this audit and accounting and your management fee and your telephone, I guess three biggies are kind of in that first section. But these, these numbers really don't usually change too dramatically year to year. Uh, maybe one to two to three percent, unless you add something new, or uh, maybe if your legal costs go up dramatically. Let's say you have something that's coming up next year where you think, well, we have a big contract we have to renew and we're going to need legal advice. So you might uh, raise your legal costs from one thousand to five thousand dollars, and that causes the percentage to be bigger. Um, but in general, you have a pretty good handle on your administrative costs year to year. The second section are maintenance costs. This is your least predictable section in terms of, we don't know what's gonna break next year. If we could predict that kind of stuff, none of us would be in our current jobs. We'd be sitting back doing nothing, right? If we could tell the future. So what we have to do for maintenance and repairs is we have to A, understand what's happening in our building now. B, hopefully you walk around your building sometimes and really look at things so you can get an idea of well, whether maintenance and repair is being done and, and does more need to be done. Like we're not painting the hallways enough. We're not painting doors enough. We're not fixing things fast enough. We don't have the money. We need more of a budget to do this. And then you should probably look at some historical data too. Just one, two, maybe three years. Don't go back five or 10 years. That's probably not going to be very useful. But look at the last few years and see what kind of trend you see. Every year we're budgeting 25,000 and every year we're spending 30,000 or 35,000. I mean, if you see that you're consistently overspending for repairs and maintenance, then you're probably under budgeting you should raise the amount. So do something that's reasonable, but also look at some historical data and also look at the, you know, look at the facts, walk around your building, check out what's going on in your building and think, we really think we could do a better job maintaining our building. That's going to take money. We need to increase our maintenance and repair section. Next are your contracts. <clears throat> I've also included payroll here. This section contracts ought to be your most predictable section. Contracts in general should be limited to items that are, can be, uh, have a written contract, okay? And are, you know, with a payment schedule laid out. So if you're gonna do elevator, you're probably paying quarterly. If you're doing monitoring, you're probably gonna pay monthly, but whatever it is, you ought to have a contract. And you'll note here, I have a best practice here. And the best practice would be to obtain updated written contracts each year, even if it's just an addendum, uh, and especially if you're audited, the auditors are doing a lot more looking at the contracts we've noticed, and they're doing a lot more of saying to us, hey, do you have some updated contracts? They want to see some updated contracts or an addendum at a minimum. It also helps keep things clear if you get the updated contracts. Sometimes things change. 
Um, so again, best practice, get written contracts. <clears throat> On payroll, obviously you should be setting your salaries before the beginning of the year so that people know what they're going to be paid. Again, these ought to be very predictable amounts. You know, here's our salary, you get paid every two weeks or twice a month, whatever it is. And it's a very predictable amount. So at the end of the day, uh, your contract amount might go up or down in terms of a whole, uh, just because you have a new contract or prices go up. Again, generally what we see if you're not getting new contracts and there's been no real changes, the prices might go up two to 3% based on some uh, inflationary pressure. But, but it would be a pretty predictable <laughs> section. Next is utilities. So for utilities, this has been a real variable, especially for this year. Obviously with more people at home and more people in buildings during the day, we've seen lots of changes here in terms of water consumption, possibly electricity consumption, uh, especially if, for example, you have a building that has three or four elevators and an elevator might be 30 or 40% of your electric bill. A lot more people at home going up and down is gonna use a lot more electricity. Gas, probably not so much. Uh, but, you know, you need to pay attention to your utilities. Do you have any supply contracts in place for electricity and gas? You can buy the actual product itself from different people. You don't have to buy it from Pepco or yeah. third party suppliers. So are those contracts coming up? And if you do have those contracts coming up, make sure you don't miss that. Because if you do miss the renewal, they're going to jack up your prices right away. And then also you wanna consider any future increases that you know from utility suppliers. So in general, the price of natural gas has been pretty consistent and consistently low for the last three to five years. That's terrific because in our area, a lot of electricity is generated by natural gas. So it's helped help. tamp down electric prices and obviously tamp down gas prices as well. Um, so that's why it's important also, sometimes if you can get a contract and those who get a contract. However, water and sewer is going to go up. In fact, on October 1st, 2020, Washington DC water raised their rates by 10%. Now I may have some condominiums here that are in Virginia or Maryland. We haven't seen as big increases there, but in DC specifically, we saw a 10% increase in prices on October 1st. So whatever number you're looking at for 2020, you better be increasing that by a minimum of 10% for 2021. And just a heads up, on October 1st of 2021, DC again will raise prices by about 8%. You can find this information on their website as, uh, as the famous line says, I'm not making this up. So be ready for an increase in water prices. Obviously you can't adjust the price, but you can try and work on consumption in your building. So again, at, on your utility projections, make sure you're living, looking at actual costs this year and building in some kind of increase for water at a minimum. Insurance. Insurance is also going to go up next year. Across the board, all of our brokers are telling us to expect a minimum increase at least two, three, if not 5%. In some cases, it could be as much as 10 or 15%. So get that input from your broker to help you inform what your decision should be on how to budget for insurance for next year. Also, of course, you want to look and see if there are any changes to your coverage that you need to have. Do you need to increase your building coverage? Do you need a fidelity policy that needs to increase? Should you have more liability? Whatever your experience is telling you, but you want to look at that and, and, and review that. Taxes, again, you don't tend to pay too much in taxes. It depends on your earnings. So, you know, if you're in DC, you pay a minimum of $250 every year to DC. Your federal uh, and your state taxes are also going to be affected by how much you're earning on your reserves. If you're a small or a mid-sized building, don't have much in reserves, you're probably not going to pay too much in taxes, but you do need to budget for it. Last but not least are your reserves. And this goes back to the question that somebody asked earlier, and I'm sorry, I didn't see who it was, but you can see under reserves, I have two best practices here. One, you should be at least 10% of assessments. That's based on the financial aspect of it. And that banks, when they want to refinance your loans or when new buyers are buying in, the banks are going to ask us, is the association setting aside at least 10% of their assessments for reserves? So I would always recommend to do at least 10%. And second, you should match what's recommended in your reserve study. We talked a little bit about that earlier. I won't go over that again at the moment. So expenses, look at them, use realistic numbers, 
dig down into the data as much as you can to make sure you're using real estate numbers and make those expenses be what you really think they're going to be for 2021. Before I move on to setting fees, does anybody have any questions on some of the approaches or any of the specifics that I laid out here? Sam, real quick, um, the like, could you give an example of something like an extraordinary event in terms of taxes um, that would that would cause that to fluctuate up or down? Yes, um, you could have a um, you could have a sale. I mean, I had buildings, for example, that have a unit that they owned and then they sold it and they made money on the sale. So if you make money on the sale, you're gonna to have to pay taxes on that money, uh, most likely. Um, if you um, had some kind of settlement with somebody and, and got extra money, it all depends on whether it's income or not. Now, a lot of times you can shelter that stuff by uh, declaring that you're gonna contribute it to reserves. And in those cases, you know, then it wouldn't be taxable. So it depends on, it depends on the source of the income and, and what your flexibility is to, to be able to do that. So if you're going to have some extra neural income because you got a you had a sale or a settlement or something to happen that's you're going to have something that's not not usual, probably you should consult with your manager. We can consult with your auditor or your tax accountant to see if there's a way to shelter that. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Sam, Start I'm sorry. Sam Howard Marks here. Uh, you mentioned about the insurance uh, going up. Uh, what is that based on? And is that to include the District of Columbia? Well, again, it, it, it's nationwide that we're seeing the increases as what our brokers are telling us. What's it based on? I mean, insurance rates are based on a couple of things. Insurance rates are based on their current income, especially on their investments. They're based on risk factors that they see across the country, as well as specific risk factors of your property. Um, and then they're based on what your loss history is. So those are the three main factors that are contributing to this. Obviously, the risk factor across the country for a lot of insurance companies is that they've avoided so far any big payouts for COVID. But that may change. And so I think that certainly that's informing some of their decisions is that they're hedging against some of that risk that they are gonna get hit with some, somebody's gonna find a way to get into insurance for some of the losses or problems that they may be having based on COVID. They also, we've had a lot of natural disasters and they're seeing a general increase in that. So again, they have to spread that risk across. You also have another factor, which is that nobody really knows how this is gonna play out, but obviously you see retail operations being hard hit, restaurants being hard hit, shopping malls being hard hit, these are, and, and, and maybe even office buildings if people don't go back to work and you see a real contraction of office use space across the country. All those things are funded a lot by insurance companies who have you know, tens of billions of dollars. And when they invest these things, they're based on getting a certain rate of return and they're long-term investments. But over the next three to five years, they're looking ahead saying, hey, are we gonna see a 10% contraction in the office market in terms of leasing? Well, 10% contraction would be a huge contraction. And that's going to mean that over the next 10 years, their sources of income from those investments is going to go down. So instead of getting the 3% return, they thought they're going to get, they're going to get a 2.5% return. Well, for, for you and me, that might not mean much money, but when you have $500 billion and you get a half a percent less, you're talking real dollars. And so those kind of things are what they look for, they forecast in the future, but that affects today's rates. So I think you have a combination of things that are happening to, to drive those insurance rates. Thank you. That's very helpful, Sam. I appreciate it. Thank sure. you. All right. Anything else? Okay. So once you think you have your expenses pinned down, you think they're realistic and they're real, <clears throat> then you need to look at setting your fees. And how are assessments calculated? So I'm going to go over this because a lot of times people don't remember or don't understand how assessments are calculated. It's not complicated. In every condominium and also for associations uh, and cooperatives, you have a document somewhere for condos. It's a declaration 
um, for uh, so for um, cooperatives, it's based on your corporate documents. But you have a you have a document that lays out what your percentage ownership is, what you are responsible for. And so your fees are based on taking your percentage for your unit and multiplying it times the budget amount, the assessment amount that the board sets that they need to cover the expenses. And when then you divide it by 12 to get your monthly, your monthly fee. And then you might add things to it. Like if they're, if you're being charged other types of fees, you know, you might be charged a, a storage fee or a parking fee or lots of other kinds of fees, but your basic assessment is based on your percentage ownership times what the board sets as the assessments for next year divided by 12. <clears throat> Here's, here's how assessment should not be calculated. We're gonna take last year's numbers and multiply them times 2% because we're gonna do a 2% increase. It may be true that the increase is equal to 2%, but one of the things that we're trying to implement at EJF is across the board, we're actually calculating the fees. In the past, a lot of times fees were calculated by just taking last year's numbers and multiplying them by 2%. The problem with that is that if you have an error in how the fees are calculated, then you're just perpetuating the error. It's important every year to actually calculate the fees so that everybody can clearly see how the fees are arrived at. Um, again, I'm kind of new in this position. And so part of my responsibility is to look at budgets and try and make sure that we're doing good practices. I'm finding a lot of places where people just multiply by 2% last year times last year's fees and they're perpetuating mistakes where fees are being miscalculated. Usually it's not by a whole lot. In some cases, we found some pretty big, large amounts where people were overpaying by 30, 40 or $50 a month. <clears throat> so it is important to make sure that we calculate the fees and calculate them correctly. Okay, so again, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that, but that's how you calculate the fees. What about other income? Your best practice here would not be to rely too heavily on other income. What do I mean by other income? Late fees, move-in fees, FOB or key fees. You know, all these fees that are unpredictable and can't really be relied upon. I gave you a good example. I have a building that from year to year, usually budgeted about $30,000 in revenue for move-in fees. That's a pretty big dollar amount. But after COVID for this year, they're probably only going to get about half of that amount. <clears throat> Fortunately, it's a pretty large budget, so it's not going to put them in the poorhouse. But when you're only getting 50% of the fees you predicted, especially if you have a smaller budget, that's going to be some meaningful dollars that you're not going to be receiving. You can look at past history and you can say, you know, every year for five years, we always get at least X in these recurring fees. And you can budget some of that. But again, I wouldn't try and rely too heavily on non-recurring income. How much can fees be raised? The magic question. Are there any limits to how much you can raise fees? So the answer isn't, the answer is in your bylaws, first of all. So it's not, it's not across the board. Um, but in, in most cases, I'd say 99% of cases, the board has the authority and the responsibility to raise fees to cover the expenses. Again, I refer you back up top. If you look back at this language in here, it's pretty clear. The budget shall contain an estimate of the amount necessary to pay the common expenses for the applicable fiscal year in a reasonably itemized form and a statement of the amount of common expenses payable by each unit owner. Pretty clear. It doesn't say you can only raise fees by 2% and make it work. What it says is you need to look at the expenses. Again, that's the first step and then raise the fees to the appropriate amount. So in general, bylaws do not contain limits on how much you can raise fees. Your responsibility as a board is to set the expenses at the right level, and then whatever that is, that's how the fee should be set, because you need to pay the expenses. It's not rocket science. And yes, sometimes that will be painful. I just looked at a budget this morning where because of COVID, their electricity, and their water costs are increasing their utility costs by almost 20% for next year. It's a big building, it's a big number. It's about $60,000 a year. That's gonna be a big increase in their fees. But that's the reality. That's what the current data is telling us. And we can't predict the future, 
but the board has a responsibility to be prepared. Again, if for some reason next year, everybody can go back to the office and it changes, they can adjust the budget in mid-year. You can adjust the budget if you need to, but for their reality right now, they need to really contemplate raising their fees a fair amount in order to pay for what are the realistic expenses. And then last but not least, do not lower reserves to balance a budget. So a lot of times people say, well, we'll just put less in reserves this year. We'll make it up next year. I can promise you, it never happens that you make it up next year because something else comes along. So again, set your, set your fees so you cover your expenses. You should include reserves in your expenses. Uh, Sam? Yes. Uh, this is Vanessa over at the Christopher. I have a question. Okay, on the expenses, uh, mm -hmm. you're referring to the operating expenses. Does that include, uh, like, when we have uh, repairs um, or damages, that kind of thing? Yeah, it includes them. Okay. Well, I mean, in, in general, I mean, obviously, there is a repair section that's in your thing. If you're talking about, I'm sorry. If you're talking about extraordinary things like insurance type events, um, I mean, obviously, it's hard to budget for that because you can't know that they're going to happen. And in, in, in general, if it's an insurance event, the insurance money will cost the expenses. So your expenses may go up, but your revenue should also go up uh, probably less whatever your, your deductible is. Does that answer your question? Or are you talking really more about capital expenditures and a capital budget? Capital, I believe. Okay. But so I will address a capital budget at the end. So okay. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Already. All right. So then I asked him here, what if the fee increase is too much? So let's say you get through all your expenses and it really just looks like I can't do this. Then you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to look at your expenses. Again, be realistic. As I say here, magically thinking only works in fairy tales. It should be magical thinking only works in fairy tales. So again, as I urged you before, be realistic. If the expenses are solid, then the assessments will need to go up. And your fiduciary responsibility is to set a reasonable amount, even if it includes a 5% or a 10% or a 20% increase. You might have a big increase because over the past years, you've not budgeted realistically so it may be now i could also argue that maybe if you've been unrealistic in the past maybe fixing it in one year is not realistic maybe it should be over two or three years but you got to work towards that getting realistic or else you're just driving your building into a, a you know a bad financial situation yeah and last but not least i talked about here something here that i call small building paradox we have a lot of buildings in Washington, D.C., especially that has a height restriction that, frankly, um, you know, they might have 10 or 20 units in them. They could be three times taller and have three times as many units, but they would still have one front door. They would still have the same size roof. They would still have one hot water heater. They would still have one, you know, maybe a generator. So all these things, instead of being divided by 20 units, the cost could be uh, attributed or allocated across 60 units, the building was three times as high. Unfortunately, in DC with height restrictions, we often can't have that. So it's really important in small buildings, especially if you have a budget that's under $100,000, you, you have to look and probably assume that the 10% is not going to be enough to set aside to, to cover your capital items, your reserve items. The small buildings, you probably have to have an outsized contribution to reserves in order to really set aside enough money. Again, it would be great if the building was three times higher, but it's not. So just be careful in those small buildings, especially if you're setting aside two, three, or four thousand dollars. Unfortunately, setting aside two, three, or four thousand dollars, especially in the environment today where we're earning no interest. You know, think about that. Even over 10 years, even over 20 years, if you're setting aside $2,000, you might end up with forty dollars or $45,000 at the end of that period. That probably is not enough to just do your roof, let alone cover hot water heaters, and brick cleaning, and you know, maybe windows, and a new front door, and a new entry system, and all the things that are included. So if you're in a small building, please be careful <clears throat> and be looking at those things. And don't get caught behind the eight ball 10 years later because you are afraid to increase your contribution to reserves. 
by the way, I have no idea who's drawing on my screen here. And I wish I knew, but I can't tell you who keeps making this yellow line. If you all can see that yellow line. All right. I note in here, be fearless. And that's just to um, encourage you to not be afraid of what the actual numbers are. All right. And last but not least, does the net income have to be zero? The answer is no, it doesn't. Your bottom line doesn't have to be exactly zero. It could be $100 or $50 or even $1,000. There's lots of good reasons why you might budget a small surplus. You obviously shouldn't be budgeting large surpluses because you're not a money-making entity, but you might have a small surplus. It's okay to not be exactly zero. What you shouldn't do is have a loss. Uh, just today, uh, right before I got on this meeting, I got an email from a bank saying, we're reviewing <clears throat> this building for a loan we can't accept this uh, budget because it has a negative number on the bottom line. <clears throat> Banks do not like to see that. They will not accept that. You have to figure a way to get a, at least zero or a positive number on the bottom line. All right, I'm going to stop here about uh, setting fees and income. Been talking for a while, but does anybody have any questions on any of these things that I went over? Yeah, this is uh, Thomas Lee uh, from the Lafayette. Um, is there a way to, what's the best way to inflation proof our um, reserves? Is there like a, a more a profitable investment product that uh, we could put our money in that will keep pace or I'll grow inflation? The answer is usually, unfortunately, no. So you should look at your bylaws, but a lot of bylaws restrict you to federally insured instruments. Therefore, you can't be in the market. You have to be basically in CDs or some kind of US government backed securities, which generally accept lower amounts, uh, 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 generally pay lower returns, I'm sorry. So the answer is that you have to kind of find that balance where hopefully the returns you can get are gonna keep up with inflation. Look in your bylaws and see if you have those limits. If you don't have those limits, then the board has to make a decision about what risk tolerance you have. I would never suggest, for example, you dump all the money into the market. Believe me, when I've had conversations with people who want to convince me that, Sam, if you look at the stock market over time, you know, it, it makes 7%. You should put all the money in the stock market. It's crazy not to. And what I try and explain to them is that your fiduciary responsibility as a board is to have the cash available when you need it, not to play the market. This is not... You know, this is not something you're doing for profit. So you need to, A, follow your bylaws, and B, you need to be pretty conservative because it might be true that you could get 7% over time. But in 2025, if you need the money and you don't have it because the market's down, we hit a bear market and you're, you know, your investments are down by 50% and you have to start selling those investments and locking those losses, you know, that's just not good for your community. So unfortunately, your hedge is often limited to certain types of investments, and that's about all you can use. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, any other questions? All right, well, hearing none, I'm gonna talk about capital budgets for just a second here, and then I will stop talking because I'm talking too much. Capital budgets. These are separate budgets from your operating budget. So everything that I've been discussing here is your operating budget. Your capital budget is what you're going to do for capital projects. These are generally things you're going to spend reserve money on. Most buildings don't set up a capital budget, but I would suggest to you that you at least think about it. <clears throat> capital budget is just like this. You should look at what your reserve study says that you're going to need to spend money on this year. Make a determination if you think that's true or not. Do we really believe that we need to replace our roof this year or could it be put off? Then also add items that you think are not in the reserve study or in the reserve study maybe two years down the road, but we really need to do this year. For example, if your roof is really leaking every time it rains and no matter how many repairs you do, it's not working. And the reserve study says you can replace, that you should replace your roof in 2030. Well, guess what? Well, you need to move that up to 2021 because the truth is, is that it makes no more sense to throw repair money on a roof like ours. It's too badly leaking. And then you do that and you put that in your capital budget. So you should set up some kind of capital budget. 
The revenue for your capital budget is the amount that you're contributing to reserves. That's this year's revenue. And then any interest that you're going to earn. The expenses are whatever capital projects you're going to undertake. And then you'll have a, a net gain or loss in, in your reserves. Again, the net gain or loss for our capital budget is not necessarily that important. You might only be setting aside $50,000 in reserves, but it may be a year when you need to spend $300,000. So your loss is going to be $250,000. That's not kind of a loss. That's expected. Your reserve holdings are expected to go up and down over time based on the projects that you're going to be, that you're going to be undertaking. So I hope that answers the earlier question somebody had about um, capital projects. But that's at your capital budget, and it's a separate budget. It doesn't take usually as much time, but it, does, it, it should be looked at. Hi, Sam. This is Janine. Uh, my, yes, my question is, do you have um, sort of a pro forma template for capital budgeting because we don't have one? Mm -hmm. And um, or I can presume that we are going to be using whatever the reserve study provides us. Is Those are the two options, right? Yes. So um, here, let me show you this. I'm going to show you this screen here. <clears throat> So this screen is uh, a, a real numbers-based budget. It would be a sample budget that I was gonna use. I, I thought it might be more distracting to have a bunch of numbers thrown at people, so I didn't use it. But essentially, you should have a capital budget here. It will look something like this. Let me make it larger. So again, your income would be your reserve contribution from this year, any special assessment that you may have, any loans that you take out, and any reserve interest. To give your total reserve income and your expenses are going to be you know these are obviously samples but roof boiler windows whatever you're going to be doing expenses and then you'll get you'll end up with at the end of that uh some kind of reserve surplus or loss in you know in the workbooks there should be a worksheet that has a capital budget in it. So one of the things that we did try and implement this year was to try and make the workbooks that go out with your budgets a little more consistent across the board. I'm not going to say we're 100% effective this year. We're, you know, we're working on this and changing these things company-wide is probably a, a two to three year process. But in most of what you should see is you should have at least this template here so that you can start filling in some numbers and making it work. Sam, on the capital budget, mm -hmm. if if there's a loss, can that loss be uh, written off? Well, two things. Um, one, you're you're already a nonprofit, so losses aren't something that are really considered for you, right? You're not okay. not you're not like a a business or a person who could use losses on my taxes and save money and that kind of thing. Uh, okay. So, so in general, losses don't help you. But again, don't think of it as a loss. Uh, I mean, a loss just means that your expenses exceed your revenue. But again, for your capital budget, that's probably going to be a normal course of events, right? And so it's not so much a loss as it's just more like it's more of a, a change in balance. Let's, do, let's, let's look at an example. Let's say you have $500,000 in your reserve fund. And let's say that you're contributing 50,000 a year. So for you, if you're contributing 50,000 a year, that's going to be, you know, your total here and you're going to end up with, you know, revenue of $50,000. Let's just assume nothing else happens. And let's say you're going to replace your new roof and it costs you $100,000. And so your total expenses at the end of the year are going to be $100,000. So your 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 quote quote loss is gonna be $50,000. So again, you had $500,000 to start with and you spent, you brought in 50,000 and spent 100,000. So yes, you kind of had a loss. But the truth is that what it really means is just that your $500,000 has been reduced to 450. And that's perfectly fine. Cause again, if you look at your reserve study it looks at 30 or 40 years, that's expected. Your cash is supposed to build to 500 and then you do the roof and it's supposed to go to 450. And then next year it's going to go back to 500. And then next year you might do $100,000 more in repairs and going to go down. So that's okay. Uh, what's not okay is what we talked about earlier. And that is that if you spend all your reserve money or you're, or you're not, setting enough, not setting aside enough reserve money. 
All right, any other questions? All right, well, hearing no more questions, thank you so much for attending today. I hope you picked up at least one or two little nuggets of information. I know oftentimes when I attend these webinars, I don't expect everything to be brand new to me, but I often get one or two useful nuggets of information. Hopefully you picked up one or two. I really appreciate you coming here today. We'll be doing more of these. As I said, we'll be doing some lunch and learns, which will be really very focused on just one subject. It'll be uh, shorter and we'll have more webinars during the course of the year as well. Please look for the announcements. This as a PDF will be sent out to everybody so you can have the talking points. And then I'll also make a recording of this available to everybody across the company, but obviously to you all as well. So you'd be able to watch me again if it was that exciting. Any questions before we sign off here? Thank you, Sam. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody. Go out thanks, and enjoy Sam. the day. Thanks, Sam. Thank you all Thank so, you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sam.